Our next guest is the CEO and co-founder of a company that has captured the world's imagination with a brand new technology that I don't think any of us thought was going to be possible. Certainly not in 2016, 17, 18, probably not even in the next 30 years. And they've raised a billion and a half dollars to do something amazing that's going to bring together people and technology in a way that we've never done it before. That company is Magic Leap. So please welcome the CEO and co-founder of Magic Leap via his robot, Roni Abovitz. Hey, what's up, Jeff? Welcome. Say hello to the audience. Hello, Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong city. Welcome, Signal. Awesome. Well, great to uh, have you here from, from Florida, from your headquarters. And, uh, you know, we wanted to talk a bit about uh, Magic Leap. So maybe just first of all, can you give the audience a sense? What is Magic Leap? Um, we're, we're a technology company that's combining three elements together. Biology in the forms of how do you interface with neurotechnology, creativity, and tech um, to do something we call a mixed reality light field, which in a simple way allows you to use your brain as a display. So think of your brain as having the world's best GPU, the world's best display output, and imagine being able to create into that, and that's pretty much what we're doing. Wow. And so how did you, how did you stumble into creating Magic Leap? Is this something you've always wanted to do? Did you, how did you start this company? Um, I think it's like watching way too much science fiction movies as a kid. <laughs> you know, um, a little bit of baseball, um, uh, being bored in school. Um, but it was, it was something I imagined. I really was hoping to, uh, I guess, liberate the things that I had seen in movies we read about in books and to just see that happen in the world. And I thought it'd be really cool. And then one day I woke up and said, if I'm not going to do it, who is? And just like took the first step out of the Shire and said, this is the big adventure. I'm going to go do it. And, and you had this, you, you had this amazing like founding idea, like you had an idea and, and you just tried it, right? Like your founding story is really amazing about how you created the technology, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we had a thesis about how the brain worked that um, the eye doesn't see. Here, I'll go turn and look at you guys. Hi, everybody. Uh, we had a thesis that the the eye is not a seeing thing, it's sort of like a, it's a CCD and it converts an analog signal into a neurologic digital one. And we had a thesis that the brain was a model builder and sort of was this amazing world building engine that created the world around you. And the question we asked was, can we hack into it in a gentle way, in a like biologically friendly way and, and open up a whole new pathway, a whole new medium for every kind of artist, developer, creative in the world. And I convinced a really brilliant NASA engineer to leave like a Mars mission and join a uh, Caltech physicist dropout, uh, a very respectable professor from a, a school in the Northwest. And we sort of got the company together and, and some other really brilliant computer scientists and said, can we do this? And the first thing we built was this giant room size refrigerator thing. And we had a dot, like a little tiny pixel dot floating in space. And we were so excited. But that was kind of our aha moment that we were, it was like our, our moment when you first played Space War where we were in there, we were making it work and it was kind of awesome. And then from that point forward, it's just been a, a really crazy ride that may have involved a spacesuit at some point on a TED talk, but I won't get into that. I love the, you told me this story once that you built this machine, like the first thing, the, the refrigerator size room thing. And then you just like got in it, like, let's see. And you just like made yourself the meat experiments of your own invention. Yeah, I was like a meat space experiment. I'm like, what's going to happen when I go when I when I put my head into this thing? What's going to happen? But um, I mean, I, I'm a biomedical engineer, so I came out of the world of respecting the body. So we were going obsessively out of our way to understand, you know, what is the neuroscience and neurobiology, what we were doing, so that we weren't really doing something harmful. We were trying to make it the most safe possible experience. Like I equated to looking at a flower. Yeah, but being the first person in it was a little bit interesting. <laughs> so how is this different from virtual reality? I mean, we've obviously, we've heard a lot about VR over the past few years, right? How is this different? 
Yeah, so I think there's terms that are being thrown around. I'll just give you my quick definition. So, you know, there's the science fiction terminology of, like, virtual reality, uh, which is, like, disappearing completely into a different world that's largely computer graphic generated. And then uh, what people have largely associated with augmented reality is, like, a text overlay, like some text on top of the world, like a, like a screen in front of your eye that has some, like, metadata. And I, didn't, I wasn't happy with either of those ideas, because what I was really wanting to do was something deeper and more metaphysical, almost spiritual, which is like, we have an amazing virtual reality engine in our head that constructs the world. And I thought that is the world's best VR system. Um, it, it makes our world, it's just biologic. So I really didn't want to replace that with some inferior piece of tech. I wanted to be a co-processor to it. Uh, so what we call a mixed reality light field is really one of the first attempts to use what we evolved into, use this amazing display engine in our brain the visual cortex, think of that as the GPU of, of our life, and how do we um, access that in kind of an amazing and biomimetic way. And that's why I think what we're doing is quite different. It's trying to use what's there, get out of the way of what's there, and not replace it and not fight it. And that's why we really created a different category for what we're up to. It, it, and it's truly interesting. I mean, I think one of the observations, right, we're talking today about humanity and technology, and VR is pretty cool, but it separates you from humanity, right? You're in a different place altogether. Whereas mixed reality is all about augmenting the physical space and the human interactions that we have with each other with more information, right? And that instead of the technology dividing us, it actually assists us in actually connecting with each other. Absolutely. We, we wanted to go back to a place where there were just people and technology would be this thing hovering there almost like magic where it's, it's the primal social relationships that we've, you know, that your ancestors had. We want that to be the way you use technology. And technology's not in the way, it's not interfering, it's not taking over your life. It's simply assisting your ability to make human connections. And, and that was really one of the dreams of getting magically brought to ground. So it's actually great being at a conference like this where you guys are talking about how do we make communication a lot more human. And that, that's really one of our absolute goals as a company. Yeah, so let's talk about what are the use cases for communications in a world of Magic Leap and mixed reality. In fact, we've got some of these slides behind us here that are some of, some of what, you know, the use cases for it. Will you walk us through this? Yeah, so uh, the first one, let me just take a quick okay, look. Okay, can back. you go, let's see, go back to the, the previous one. Go back. Uh... Okay, so this one right here, um, we think of that as, uh, we call that like mom visiting you for birthday. Uh, so at the company we have a mom role. Um, we got to make moms happy and I think that's a big piece of what we're up to. Um, and imagine like, you know, your mom lives in another state or another country and instead of that Princess Leia showing up, you know, asking help from Obi-Wan, there's your mom looking, you know, solid, looking you in the eye, singing you happy birthday uh, with your boyfriend or girlfriend. And it just feels, outside of the fact that she's not really there, uh, but there's a sense of complete presence, her light field and her sound field, like almost like a spiritual essence of your mom is there. You're looking her in the eye, you're talking in real time. Uh, this is absolutely the kind of thing we, we, we're going to be enabling at Magic Leap, and hopefully with Jeff and the Twilio team, uh, making it possible for developers around the world to like build things like this quite easily. Um, and, and the idea that you move from texting or sort of video chat to something that feels incredibly primal, everyone knows how to do this. The first thing you do when you're born is you look in your mom's eyes. So looking in your mom's eyes feels like such a primal ancient thing, and making that happen with Magic Leap is a really key goal. And that was what we were trying to embody with this one. And uh, if, can we show the, uh, the other demo, the, the group working together? Yeah, that one. This is really cool, right? Because not only do you obviously have this 3D floating model out there, but you also have one of the participants is not in the room. Yeah, so this one's a really interesting one. Um, uh, it's combining a couple things. So um, I'll talk about the bottle and I'll talk about the other person. So uh, one of my friends has a company called Onshape and the ability to sort of create um, an existing model, like a CAD model and render it and, and multiple people can see this. Multiple people can edit it from around the world using like an internet service. So uh, we've actually built that in the company, seen it running, it's quite amazing. So here we are like two people in Brooklyn working on a water filtration system for Africa, like a really cool little mini startup, maybe an Indiegogo kind of thing. Um, except our friend might, maybe lives in Portland um, and she shows up into this. So you've got a virtual object that people are manipulating and editing in real time and they're making product decisions. Two people are in the room together, maybe in Williamsburg in a loft. 
Um, and then their friend is also part of their company, and she has real presence. Like, right now I feel like a second-class citizen as a robot because I'm not completely there. I'm kind of there. Like, I could, you know, but, like, if Jeff offered me some water, I really can't drink it. Um, but I'm, I'm actually put out a water for you. Here. Got my own. Um, but the idea that, like, you can have a natural conversation, like, <laughs> thank you. The, the idea in this image is that the two people talk to each other for real in Brooklyn. When someone talks, you can turn your head and look them in the eye. When the, when the magically person who might be in Portland talks, you can turn and look her in the eye. So you're having a very normal discussion between three people as if you were all really there. And our goal is to enable that kind of experience and to be able to have people build that kind of application to almost anything you're doing. Um, and by the way, this is not like uh, for science fiction. Uh, we're building kind of the bones of this. We call Avatar Chat, and I actually was in front of a full-size person who looked pretty amazingly real just a couple days ago, and you could walk all around her, and she could smile and move around. So this kind of thing is really happening. So here's here's the thing, right? In general, I would say, Roni, that's a really nice slide, but you're full of shit. <laughs> I would agree with but, you haven't visited us. But I, and you, you told me it was okay to tell this. Um, I've worn Magic Leap. I've used it. Like, this is real. This is cool. This is going to happen. And one of the questions I bet many people in our audience have is, are developers going to get early access to get to start building apps on Magic Leap? Well, that's a great question, Jeff. Um, so, Jeff and I plotted the idea that, um, uh, you know, step one is uh, Magic Leap and Twilio working to integrate uh, what I think are the amazing services and components for communication that Jeff and his team have built uh, into our SDK and, and make that happen and build our first hello world. And then we talked about having 10 people, uh, 10 dev teams, um, one of whom uh, Jeff's going to select in a special way and nine who will work through uh, in another way that Jeff and his team will work with us to pick out, but we'll have that inner circle of the first 10 devs as like the very next ring once we work out with Twilio, our first build, getting the next 10 in there, um, and then opening up to the whole team. So we have people at our company stopping by all the time, building stuff, we're boot camping, and I think it'd be really exciting to have the first 10 uh, Twilio devs come in, uh, you know, we'll build a hello world, this is how you do stuff, and then have you guys build something with us and be amongst the first people in the world to get your hands on what we're doing and make really cool things. So 10 developers from the Twilio community will get to hack on Magic Leap and be the first to do it. Absolutely. That's awesome. <laughs> and oh, um, my, my robot friend thumb up, there we go. And uh, so you know what we're gonna do? The first developer that we're gonna pick from the 10 who are gonna get to get get hands on Magic Leap, uh, is going to be the winner of Bash tonight. Yep. Just up the ante on Bash. So the developer who scores the most points tonight in the Bash competitions is going to be the first picked to get hands on Magic Leap and start building apps. It's going to be really cool. And the other thing that we wanted to announce, you alluded to it, but uh, Magic Leap and Twilio have started working together. We are starting working together, and I guess Jeff and I will do a ceremonial fist bump. There we fist go. bump. And, uh, and Twilio is working with the engineers at Magic Leap to power the communications inside of Magic Leap. Yeah, we think that's going to be an amazing, uh, amazing combination of experiences. It really is. Communications is going to be such an amazing part of the Magic Leap experience, and so we're really excited to be working with you on that. We're, we're, we're more excited and we're more buzzed. So, so do you think that next year at Signal, a year from now, the audience here will be able to be using uh, Magic Leap? Uh, this, is, this is the point of the discussion where I'm just going to give you guys a Cheshire, gra a Cheshire Cat grin and just go like this. <laughs> a very good possibility. All right, take that as you will. Let's hear it for Roni Abovitz and Magic Leap. This is so cool, and it will change our lives. I am absolutely convinced of it. Thank you very much, Roni. All right, now, to uh, talk a little bit more about some of the products that Twilio's been building, please welcome back up to the stage, 
Vice President of Products at Twilio, Patrick Maltek. Uh, tough act to follow, but fortunately, uh, we have some new products today, and so I'm going to jump right into it uh, and start talking about what, what they can do for you. Um, so today, Twilio is adding support for push notifications through a product we're calling Notify. Notify is everything that you would expect of a Twilio API. It comes with a simple, easy to use REST interface, as well as support, support for both iOS and Android for seamless integration into your apps. And if Notify was just the push API, it would be a great new addition to the Twilio lineup. But Notify is a lot more than that. See, Notify takes a different approach to notifications. We looked around the world at all the different notification services that were out there, and we thought something was wrong. They all dealt with things like tokens and topics and devices. Um, and really what they were doing was just pushing the problem of managing state across multiple different devices down to the developer. Who amongst us only has one device anymore? All of us have many different devices, and they need to work seamlessly uh, across those devices. And so at developers, we don't think that that makes sense. See, with Notify, the model is all based around the user, not the device, not the token. And this is because the user is at the center of all your applications. Notify keeps track of all the different registered endpoints. And so whether you're trying to alert someone on uh, their phone, their iPad, or maybe they lost their phone and you need to buzz the last year's iPhone um, in their drawer, we can go ahead and do that. Whether you're notifying just one or 100 different devices, the notification code that you write with Notify does not change. We also know that as developers, you need to reach your customers wherever they are. And because Notify is based on the user, and your users exist in many different channels, we've gone beyond just push. Yes, we've added SMS support for Notify as well. See, we saw a common problem across many of our customers. Your services would uh, be alerting someone with their phone number, uh, and sooner or later they may install your mobile app and you want to seamlessly switch over to push notifications. Later on, however, though, the customer may uninstall that app. They may get a new phone. And you would no longer be able to contact that user through your mobile app. And so your apps would do one of two things. Most would do this. Nothing. <laughs> they would send push requests into the ether, usually ignoring failures from Google and Apple. Um, and meanwhile, their customers who've given them their phone number and asked them to ask you to notify them would get upset that they no longer receive those notifications. The other pattern we saw here was something like this. We just go ahead and contact them in every channel. That way we'll be sure they got the message. Anybody had this experience recently? Probably sent you an email as well. And we weren't doing this because we want to upset or, or annoy our users. We're doing it because it's hard. It's hard to keep track of state across your mobile app, uh, across your website where you're usually collecting the phone number. Uh, and it's really, really difficult to coordinate across all these other channels. Many companies even split the ownership up across different groups. Sometimes your support organization has access to the phone number, and there's a completely different team that built the mobile app. But Notify is a lot more than just a multi-channel notification product which puts the user at the center. See, Notify is programmable, just like the rest of Twilio. You can program it through something that we call orchestrations. Orchestrations allow you to define the notification logic for your users and let Twilio execute that logic on your behalf. So let's take a look at a few of these orchestrations. So obviously Notify supports what we call the fan out orchestration. If notifying your customers on every device is the right thing for you, you can go ahead and do that with a fan out orchestration. But you can also use the failover orchestration. So if a customer has uninstalled the app, they've gotten a new phone, or they didn't acknowledge a notification that you sent to them, you can fail over to another channel. And with Notify Mobile and Web SDKs, you're going to be able to notify folks on their uh, last used device and their current active device. And these are just some of the notifications that we have planned for Notify. So who wants to see Notify in action? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and send a notification out to this entire audience here. 
Um, so the first thing you're going to see, I'm going to pull up the Twilio console, and we have a brand new section of the console here um, called Notify. You see a brand new icon uh, and a whole set of services here. So you'll see that there's this services page here. And really what the services page is, it's a container for where you store all of your user information. Um, and you'll see that we have one service that's already provisioned. That service is called Signal. Uh, and when all of you signed up for Signal, you handed us your phone number, uh, and we went ahead and stored you in Notify so that we could send a notification to you uh, later on today. Um, the other thing that happened was some of you went and installed our, our mobile app for this show. Uh, there's about 7% of you on, on Android and about another 20% that have installed uh, and signed in on uh, Apple. And what we did was Notify seamlessly detects when you log in. It sees that it's the exact same user, uh, and now that there's a new channel that we can reach you on. And so what I'm going to show all of you today is us sending out one notification that will reach all of you uh, in, in the appropriate channel. So for those that haven't downloaded the mobile app or haven't logged in, you're going to go ahead and get an SMS. Uh, for those that have logged into the app, uh, you should be receiving a push through that app. Cool. So one more thing here. You can see that you can actually upload uh, additional push credentials. So these credentials that we have up here right now are the ones powering the mobile apps that are uh, already installed. So we're going to go over and do one more thing here. I want to grab the service instance SID. Uh, I'm going to use this in code later on to make sure that we're pushing to this service instance. So go over to the command line. And for this, we're just going to pull up the node REPL. Um, and we will do first initialize the Twilio helper library, uh, Twilio. Uh, and what this is going to do, this is going to initialize our node helper library uh, and make it really, really easy to send out notifications from the node REPL. Uh, I've already uh, provisioned this environment with some environmental variables around the account SID and auth token so that you don't need to see any of that stuff. Great. So now let's go and let's grab a reference to that service. So we'll do to twilio.notifications.services. Um, and I'm going to go paste in that service instance. Great. And just so you all can see, uh, we now have a reference to that service instance that's running. Cool. So the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to go uh, services uh, service dot notify locations dot create. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and send a message to the audience. Uh, and the body here is going to be the following. Uh, we are going to say, join us tonight at bash. OK. Uh, and there's one more thing here that I haven't told you about Notify. Notify also supports something called segmentations. Uh, so this allows me to actually send, uh, specify a tag uh, and send only to the users that have that tag. So we're going to add one more tag here, which is uh, the checked in. Uh, checked in tag. And we'll go ahead and close that out. And we'll print out the response here, console.log. Great. That looks good. And go ahead and send that. Great. And you see that the notification was created, and you saw a push that just came through here. Uh, and all of you should be receiving a push or an SMS on your phones right now. So that's Notify. And it was only a few lines of code were able to send out notifications to 2,000 people across three different discrete channels. You all saw that it was multi-channel and user-centric, uh, but you also saw segmentation. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. So segmentations allow us to target a specific set of our audience. Um, so Notify allows you to segment by adding tags every time you uh, create those users as part of Notify. And you can specify which tags you want to uh, target in, in your requests. But there's a, something else you can do that's interesting with tags. You can actually use Boolean operators as well. So you can specify people with this tag and this tag and this tag and get the intersection of those groups and only notify those users. Or you can do the union of those groups as well. Um, and this is really, really powerful. This makes sure that you're able to target the right segment of your audience. There's one more reason why we think you're going to love Notify. And that's support for messaging apps. And today we're announcing support for uh, uh, Messenger, Viber, and WeChat all as part of Notify. And as more channels for customer communications become available, 
you can count on Twilio to make this available for your applications. With this proliferation of ways to reach your end users, keeping all that notification logic in sync between your applications, SMS, and now this, all the different various messaging apps that are available is only getting harder. Notify helps you centralize and manage that logic through the use of segmentations and orchestrations. This lets you communicate with your customers in whatever channel they prefer, putting the user at the center of your interactions. This lets you focus on who you want to notify, not how. Notify is going to go ahead and take care of all the rest. So that's Notify, multi-channel messaging support so you can reach your users wherever they are. Orchestrations, so you can choose the right channel for each user. And then finally, segmentations to help you contact the right set of your users. The Notify REST API with support for push to your apps and segmentations, as well as SMS, is available in developer preview today. Support for orchestrations in web and mobile SDKs will be coming later this year. And all Signal attendees should be receiving an invite where you can enter a code inside the console to get access. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Jeff, who's going to tell you a little bit more about how we see the world of messaging evolving. All right, so if you've been paying attention to the world of technology, the world of communications, if you've been reading the press, you'd see there's a lot of crazy things going on in the world of communications. You've got artificial intelligence, intelligent agents, AI, IA, chats in apps, apps in chat, and don't forget bots. Bots, 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 bots. What the hell is going on <laughs> with technology these days, man? It's confusing, but there is something real happening. To understand the trend and the future of communications, you first have to understand this, the artisanal pickle. Handmade in small batches, locally produced, by Joe and Bob in Brooklyn, admire their beards. Artisanal pickles, however, are not about being fancy. It's about being human. See, there's a movement going on to re-humanize business, put relationships and human scale back into play. And it's not just pickles. It's handmade goods on Etsy. It's getting a ride from another person via Lyft or Uber. It's staying in an Airbnb, someone's house, not one of a thousand hotel rooms in a mega hotel. Right? It's a throwback to the days of the shop, where there was a shopkeeper who knew your name, and when you walked in, asked you how the kids were. And I think this is a trend that's going on. See, in the last century, post-war, we started putting technology to work to build mass scale, automation. Corporations got huge. And we got track housing at McDonald's and Velveeta cheese. Yeah, it comes in slices. But the thing is, that technology has swung too far. In the post-millennial times, we're begging for a return to humanity. I think that's what you're seeing in all these trends. And that's pretty much the state of how business communications are today. See, IVRs, long hold times, these are the Velveeta of business communications. Massive, impersonal, factory produced. And the anonymity of it all is dehumanizing us. But we don't treat each other like database entries when we communicate. We're people. Yet that's how businesses treat us. And so I think what we're finding now in the post-millennial age here is it turns out business is human after all. People doing business with each other. And great businesses know 
that these experiences matter. You know, Nordstrom, Four Seasons, they give you a personalized experience. Luxury brands do this. But you know what? Being treated like a human isn't a luxury. It's just a common courtesy. And I think we're all feeling that way. But there's been a belief that you can't do human and scale at the same time. But the good news is the technology is changing. And in some ways, the same technology movement that gave us Velveeta cheese is also going to solve this problem and bring humanity back to how we communicate with each other. See, it used to be that as consumers, we just called each other and we had a nice synchronous phone conversation. And that's all we did when we chatted. And the same thing happened for business. You would call a business, you'd have a nice synchronous conversation and that was the end of it. But somewhere along the way, the hold times grew longer, the IVRs grew more complex. Suddenly, you've got an hour-long phone call with some company, 55 minutes of it is asynchronous, sitting on hold only to have five minutes of synchronous communication. And the thing is, waiting on hold is not synchronous communications. It's just rude. But the interesting thing is that newer technologies are changing how we communicate. There's a reason why as consumers, we don't call each other as much anymore. We use messaging to communicate with each other. Because messaging solves this problem. See, in the world of messaging, I send you a text message. And I don't know if you're doing nothing. I don't know if you're in a meeting. I don't know if you're sleeping on a plane. So if you get back to me in a minute, great. An hour, OK. A day, OK. That's fine. That's the expectations we have around messaging. And it's OK. Get back to me when you can. And that's how businesses should be interacting with customers because it's the right expectation on both sides. It's better for the consumer. I don't want to wait on hold for an hour. Just send me a text when you get the answer. I'm fine with that. And it's better for companies too. It's more flexible in how they staff those operations. It's better for everyone. And so businesses need to start communicating like people do. That's the key. That's how we start bringing humanity back into how we interact with businesses and the expectations all around are better. In fact, I've got three things that we think every business can do to become more human. The first thing is, pick the channel that matters to your customer. Right, a few years ago, I noticed that my dad started texting me instead of calling me, because he realized I was increasingly answering the phone less and less and less. And he said he's, he still wants to communicate with me, so he started texting. Good job, Dad. I assume you're watching. <laughs> right? But that's the same thing businesses need to do with your customers. That's why we're supporting all these channels, SMS, push notifications, all these different things. Use the channel your customers want. And the second thing is about context. See, when we communicate with each other, we know what's going on. If my dad were to call me tonight, he'd say, how did Signal go? Right? But think about it. If you have a conversation with somebody in your personal life, and five times during that call, they asked you your name and why you're calling, that would be a considered a medical condition. <laughs> right? But that's what happens when we talk to businesses all the time. So companies need to start using the context of what we know about our customers, who they are, why they're likely talking to us, Everything we know in the mobile app of a company's product, the call center agent should know too. Hi, Jeff. How can I help you? I see you ordered a product yesterday. How's it going? Right? That's the kind of conversations we should have. And the last thing in which businesses can be more human is to use human language. Right? Don't corporate wash everything you say. Actually empower people to talk as human beings to customers. Even bots today have personality. Think about that, right? You have to be human accessible. In fact, we've done this in one way recently. Uh, as of yesterday, the Twilio terms of service are actually written in human speak. See, right next to our, the official terms of service, you have a human accessible version that tells the non-lawyer what you're signing up for. 
And it's really cool. Our legal team did an amazing job in explaining in a very human way what you're signing when you sign our terms of service. And so I think this notion of speaking human can be implemented in many ways in business and help us return from a world where businesses do their own thing and us consumers have to adapt to it. But rather, let's talk to each other. We're all human beings. And so all of these things together essentially mean that to be human, businesses have to have conversations. That's what it means. And Twilio is here to help you do that. So if you look at what uh, we've been building, right? The first point is all the channels of communications that you might need to use to talk to your customers because that's what your customers prefer, we're supporting. Whether it's SMS, push, IP messaging in an app, and even now the new messaging apps, including WeChat that we announced today. Right, reach your customers how they want to be reached and we're here to support you. In fact, we want to be at the center of your notifications. We want to be at the center of your messaging strategy. We want to be your messaging hub so that you know whatever way you want to talk to your customers, we're there to help you and we're at the center of this. That's our goal. In fact, we just launched the Notify product to help you do that. But the thing is, notifications are not enough. Notifications are not conversations. That's just one part of it. That's you talking to the customer. Every notification, however, is just the beginning of a conversation. But in order for it to feel human, in order for it to be a conversation, there's something left. It's easy to have a conversation. All you have to do is hit reply. It's that easy. That's what turns a notification into a conversation. And I believe companies that do this are going to be the ones people prefer to work with because it's human. I have a question. But I know why so many companies don't allow you to reply to, say, that SMS that you get. The reason is it's hard. You have to take the building blocks, you have to build a UI, you have to build out all the application logic, you have to you know, train people on how to use an app you built, and then there's a lot of corner cases. I know it's hard. I get why more people don't do a great job of this. But the thing is, as a messaging hub, Twilio also has many great solution companies running on top of Twilio who've solved this problem. Some of them have solved it as contact centers and help desks that allow people to log in, see incoming messages, and reply to them easily. In fact, the messaging paradigm is so easy and so useful because the messages are short. It's easy to get a quick reply back to a customer. And other of these companies are doing bots, allowing you to train various ways of having uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, rules-based engines, actually do a lot of the work for you. You may say, Jeff, isn't this human after all, but a bot that actually works well can actually give customers what they want and answer quickly, and that's cool. But today, it's really hard to actually integrate these things into an app you've built, right? If you've built an app that does notifications, something like that, it's actually really hard to figure out what the options are here and integrate it into your workflow and to make it work. And so today, we're really excited to announce something that's coming next from Twilio. And that is something that we are calling messaging integrations. It's the ability to provision these partner solutions in one click and add them to your Twilio account. And integrate between that solution and your Twilio account so that you can have messages start flowing into a solution that will let you hit the reply button. And there's some really cool options here. In fact, one of the companies uh, up here is a company called Front. And they're an app to help you manage inboxes. And one of those inboxes is SMS. And so please welcome up the CEO and co-founder of Front, Mathilde Colon, to tell us a bit more. So to start off, tell us a bit about Front. Sure. So Front is easy. It lets multiple people reply to one inbox. Uh, so we started with email addresses, for example, support at sales at press at. We added Twitter, Facebook, and Twilio. <laughs> so you've been doing SMS for a while now, right? Yeah, for a year and a half. And today we have over 500 companies that use text and front to manage their communication with their customers, with their leads, with their workforce, etc. Awesome. The, the companies who hit the reply button. I love it. Yeah. And 
tell me, why do you find those customers want to use SMS as a channel instead of saying, hey, just email us or just hit us on Twitter? Yeah, I guess it depends on different teams. So for example, we've seen that operations team use SMS to communicate with their workforce. Um, the reason is because most of the time when a cleaner or a driver needs to reach out, it's for urgent issues, and SMS is the fastest way to communicate by far. Then we have customer support teams that use the product. Then the reason is, as you said, because they're very personal and it creates an intimate relationship with their customers. Um, recently, we've seen more and more sales teams use the product. So for example, we have that company that has a pricing page to return text us at, and they've seen more engagement with text than with email. Awesome. I think that is the trend going forward. I mean, you need to be able to talk to a company, and the thing is, pick the channel that's most relevant. And SMS is this fantastic channel. It's quick, it's conversational, and people are thoroughly accustomed to it in their personal life. Yeah, exactly. And, and because it's be before we started the company, it was really hard to get this two-way conversation. I think when uh, it, it can create a real wow effect when you receive a notification, which you always do. So for example, your driver is here. Just or, did. Yeah, e exactly. Uh, but then when you realize that you can actually reply and someone will reply back, then customers most of the time are amazed. It is. It's magical. Let's actually show a demo of how this uh, messaging integration works. Sure. So what we've got here, actually, this is the notification that uh, Pat just sent. Let's pull it up on the screen. There we go. So this is uh, Pat just sent this. And uh, we'll go back to the Twilio account that Pat sent it from. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the, stay, stay here. <laughs> we're going to show off front. So we're going to go to programmable SMS here. And, um, the notify service actually uses a messaging service to do the delivery. That's because you get all the intelligence of Copilot. So if SMS is the right channel to reach the customer on, then it invokes all the Copilot functionality of using the best phone number to send it from. And if you're local, if you're from France, use a French number. If you're in America, use an American number. Use a short code in, in the United States. Uh, all the intelligence that Copilot brings. And so you can see we've got this messaging service down here. And we can click on that, Signal 2016. And this is the service that we use to send that notification to all of you. And you can see that we've got this setting here. It says, when a message comes in, do nothing. And there's a startling number of companies for whom that is the, <laughs> that is the setting today, right? So we're actually going to change this. And it used to be that you, know, you had two options, do nothing or configure a webhook to your application. But now you can see there's actually a bunch of options of what you can do with a message when it comes in. You can do nothing. You can route it to a webhook. But you can also route it to a help desk call center. Or you can route it to a bot. So in this case, we are going to route it to front. And so we click front. We're going to click Save there. And now we're going to go over to our front account. And you can see that uh, the account here, we've got a list of messages waiting for us. And um, everybody, take out your phone. Reply to the notification that you got. You can see them here. There we go. There you go. When and where? Oh my god, there they are. Hi, mom. <laughs> hey, boss. <laughs> Yay. Let's see. Yay, indeed. <laughs> All right, where else? Sure, cool. How about this? Yeah, isn't it? And we can just plow through it. Isn't it really cool? Indeed, signal is fun. Wow, great. I'll, I'll reply to you. There we go. Uh oh, I think I might have broken something. There we go. All right. Whoa, yeah. Love, love being able to have a conversation. Yeah, isn't it cool? Oh, you know what? Don't read people's phone numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Text in at your own. Oh, no, we got a French one here. You're going to have to take over. Uh, wow, I didn't expect this to work. Seriously? Thank you. Seriously? Wait, where's the French one? I want, I want to give you the keyboard. <laughs> All right. Awesome. So that's the demo of Twilio and Front working together. And this is coming soon. You'll be able to pick from any variety of our partners and with one click, attach your Twilio account to that partner's account and then be able to start replying to those messages. It's really easy. It's really cool. Let's hear it from Mathilde and Front. Thank you, Mathilde. Thank you. All right. So if you remember one thing, if you remember one thing from everything I said today, it's this idea that business is becoming more and more human. And I think that is a trend of our day. And it's fun to make fun of hipsters, but I think they're onto something. I think we all crave human connection in this age of technology. 
Now, I can't imagine a more powerful example of human communications that matter than communications that occur when someone is in crisis and is reaching out for help. And so our next doer of 2016 is someone who's built the world's first and only national text crisis line. This is a nonprofit. It's called the Crisis Text Line. They handle more than 1.5 million messages every month from people reaching out who need help in a variety of situations. And I'd like to now introduce, well, actually first, let's give her a doer award because she certainly deserves it. Our first doer of day two for 2016, Nancy Lublin, founder and CEO of Crisis Text Line. And now I'd like to welcome her on the stage. I run a communications company. It just happens to be a mental health not-for-profit organization. Uh, it was born from the rib of another entity. I was the CEO of something called DoSomething.org, which is the largest organization for young people in America. It has about 5.5 million members. And every week, Do Something texts, because that's how you communicate with your teenagers, texts young people campaigns, things they can do that don't require money, an adult, or a car, but that will make the world a better place. Things like collecting peanut butter for food pantries, and the whole thing is, are you team crunchy or team smooth? Okay, so who is smooth? Yeah, we're in San Francisco. Smooth actually wins, but you all are crunchy. <laughs> And we'll send out these text messages, and as you know, it has a 97% open rate, skews Hispanic and urban. We'll have about 200,000 jars of peanut butter collected in a month. But there was a side effect that we never predicted, a use case that we never expected. Every time Do Something sends out a message, a couple dozen messages come back that are out of flow, having nothing to do with peanut butter or homelessness or do something, but things like, I'm being bullied and I don't want to go to school tomorrow. The kids are really mean. Or, my best friend is addicted to crystal meth. What should I do? And we would send back messages. We would triage this, talk to your principal. Um, maybe you should see a doctor. Here's a hotline. And then we got a message from a girl that just stopped us in our tracks and we had to rethink this. It literally said, he won't stop raping me. It's my dad. He told me not to tell anyone. And then the letters, are you there? We gave her the phone number for RAIN, the Rape and Incest Organization. They're fantastic. Didn't hear back from her. Um, the next day, gave it to her again. Um, do something has never heard back from her. Um, I've actually personally taken that mobile number and tried to call her, tried to text her, and have had no response. I don't know if she's dead or alive. I don't know if she's safe. And it wasn't enough. So I set out to build Crisis Text Line. We launched in August of 2013, so we're not even three years old. We're a toddler. And as Jeff said, we're already processing a heck of a lot of messages. We're about to cross our 18 millionth message. I know you all are tired, but you can clap. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that text is a phenomenal way to counsel people. You don't, no one overhears you. It's very private. Some of you could be texting us right now. Um, please don't, but you could be. <laughs> Um, we spike every day at lunchtime. Um, kids are in the cafeteria and they're freaking out about a calculus exam or they're about to have a bulimic episode and you think they're texting like the boy across the cafeteria, they're actually texting us. You don't hear the word like or um. You don't get hyperventilating or crying. We just get facts. They can screenshot things and save great advice, coping skills for later. 
or they can delete the entire thing and no one will ever know that they texted us. About 30% of our messages are about suicide and depression. Another 18% about anxiety. I'll just I'll give you an example of something that happened only a couple of weeks ago. A girl texted in saying that she was in her bedroom, locked in her bedroom with a gun, and that she had been planning this for weeks. The only thing keeping her alive was a sibling, and he wasn't home that night, and she was going to take her life. Her mother, she said, was a substance abuse user, and her mother's boyfriend um, was sexually abusing her. And so we have crisis counselors on the other side. These are people who have applied, gone through a background check, done 34 hours of training, which includes background checks and quizzes. Um, these are crisis counselors like Ellen. And so Ellen works with our supervisors who are paid full-time staff. They're nurses or social workers, and they call 911. And I will tell you that that girl from three weeks ago is not only alive today, but her, boy, her mother's boyfriend was arrested, so she is now safe in her own home. And it, this may seem like one of those exceptional stories that, you know, like the not-for-profit executive director is supposed to come out and like tell you and make you all feel like, oh, that's so great. We do that eight times a day. Eight times a day, we trigger an act of rescue. I, I also want to tell you that Ellen is actually a real person, and she's here. Ellen uh, was inspired to become a crisis counselor because her own cousin died by suicide as a teenager. And she thought this was an amazing way to give back. And this year, on the anniversary of her cousin's death, she was actually on our platform helping other people. She thought that was the right way to market. And amazingly, another teenage girl who was suicidal was on the platform that light. Ellen handled the conversation, triggered the act of rescue, and saved a life. Did you stand up? That's Ellen. Go, oh, come on. Where is she? That... I think it's also really important to tell you that being a first responder, being a caregiver is really hard. So Ellen has support. Her boyfriend sometimes bring her, brings her cookies, apparently, on Tuesday nights when Ellen is on. And her boyfriend works for Twilio. <laughs> so everyone should give Orion a hug if you meet him over the next day also. It's, it's pretty exciting that we're able to help this many people, um, but the part that I'm really excited about is who we're helping. 6% of our texters are Native American. That means they're rural, they're low income, and they're most at risk for dying by suicide. 15% uh, of our texters are Hispanic, even though right now we're still an English-only service. If you take the bottom 10% of area codes by socioeconomic status in the United States, they take up 19% of our volume. So our service is reaching people, because it's text, our service is reaching people who are low income, rural, and don't have other access to mental health services. These are people who don't have guidance counselors in their schools or family shrinks that they can call. Um, we're helping those people. One of the things I'm most excited about Crisis Text Line is the data. So because it's text, we can use all kinds of things that we've built to auto-tag conversations in real time. This is actually the largest mental health data set that's ever been collected. And we have the volume, velocity, and variety to have a really juicy data corpus that makes us faster and better and can make the world better, too. So how do we use it to make us faster and better? When you are in a hospital emergency room with a sprained ankle, you wait and the gunshot wound goes first. And we think that's how a crisis text line should work also. So if you text in, I want to die, I want to kill myself, or a couple of weeks ago when someone texted in saying, I want to shoot up everyone at my school, you become number one in the queue. We code you orange, and we are taking those people in about 1.4 minutes. 
through machine learning about 11 months ago now, we started seeing that I had a really bad day. Hashtag KMS was number one in the queue. And we were like, why is a bad day number one in the queue? Hashtag KMS, we learned, thanks to the algorithm, is short for kill myself. Again, we're English only, but if you text in quiero morir, you're number one in the queue because the algorithm understands that. This is Skynet making us faster and more accurate. No one got that joke, really? <laughs> okay. The crisis girl can make nerd jokes, too. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. Delayed laugh. Good. I'll take it. <laughs> I may quote Tron later, also. The original. Um, So we use this data to make us faster and more accurate. We can also know what conversations are about even before a human might recognize what they're about. Because it's such a large database, we, can, we layered on a naive Bayes algorithm and we can do some predictive work. So we know that if you say certain things, the conversation is about certain things. We know that if you say words like nums and sleeve, there's a 90 plus percent match for, can you guess it? Cutting self-harm. We know that if you text in rubber band and MG, there's a 90 plus percent match for something. Can you guess that one? MG is milligram. Substance abuse. And what we're building this summer, and actually our product manager is here who's leading this product, who was a nurse and is now one of our product managers, Nan, you can just wave, um, is we're now going to layer on this summer suggested messages for the crisis counselor, for people like Ellen to send back. Hey, 90% match for substance abuse. You might want to try one of these coping skills as a suggestion. This is bringing science for the first time ever to counseling. I'm going to throw myself under a bus here for a second. Uh, actually, my husband, not me. Um, how do you know that your marriage counselor is any good? You don't. You don't know if your shrink's any good. You don't know if your life coach is any good. I know a lot of you out here think, well, she, she went to Stanford. Of course she's good. Um, I was taught growing up to just find the Jewish doctor closest to me, and I would be set. Um, but you know what? Ten, like, there were people who graduated in the bottom 10% of Stanford. Are you sure that's not your shrink? When my husband and I went to see a marriage counselor once, we're good now, but we did go once. And um, at the end of the first session, she looked at us and said, OK, see you guys in two weeks. But Jason, I need to see you alone next week. And we walked out, and I was like, she's a fucking genius. She knows you're the problem. <laughs> How else do you know your marriage counselor is any good? You don't. We do. So we now have data. Um, we know how many conversations Ellen has taken. We know her response times. We know that she's really fast, according to our average. And so what we're doing now is we're going to be building dashboards like Uber drivers have for how many rides they did that week and where they were and what their average uh, price point was and length of time. Or like Fitbit is telling you, we're going to be making those things uh, to, for, to support our crisis counselors so that Ellen can have more support than just Orion bringing her cookies. Uh, although that's pretty good. The other way that we use data besides helping us to be a great organization is we want to use this to help the world to feel a little bit less pain. So if you go to crisistrends.org, you'll see that we've scraped all the PII and we've posted aggregate data. So you can see that the worst time of day for substance abuse, like by far, is 5 a.m. Or that the worst day of the week for eating disorders is Sunday. And that the state with the highest suicidal ideation in America is a lovely place to visit, but apparently a scary place to live, and that's Montana. And so what happens with this information? Well, the governor of Montana calls us, and we launched essentially a tailored solution for Montana with a particular keyword last week. If you text in MT to our number, you're tagged as Montana, and we can have customized resources on the back end that our crisis counselors see. We can have a more rich data set for the state of Montana to understand what the heck is going on there. The other way that we use data is we've decided to open up Enclave data for non-commercial use. So we've had applications from academics. This is a particular uh, point here. We heard from the Department of, of Transportation who asked us for our data on suicidal ideation in the Bay Area so they could understand what's going on with the deaths on the Caltrain tracks. We heard from a college in Canada who wants to look at all of our LGBTQ texts 
to compare them to public data on hate crimes to see if we can understand what's going on there. There are so many things that we can learn and systems change that can happen from this data. So I run a communications company, much like yours. It is all about human connection, like Jeff said. The difference is we can't afford any downtime. We have to have 100% reliability, which is why we're here today for Twilio.org uh, and for Twilio itself, and why we're moving everything onto that platform. We can't afford any outages. There are lives at stake. We need to bring this to other countries where there are no mental health services, no data on domestic violence or substance abuse. We know it's happening, but we don't know where or when in a lot of these places. And we want the flexibility to build really great features to make Ellen's job as fast and as possible, as, as positive as possible. So I'm here as a communications company on behalf of the stressed out 32-year-old developer in San Francisco who texts us about his anxiety, the girl locked in her bedroom with a gun, and I'm absolutely here for that girl who's being raped by her father and has nowhere else to turn. Text is amazing, and it's saving lives every day. So I want to thank Jeff. I think he's going to come out here now and, and talk a little about Twilio.org. We're really grateful to be on top of this platform. And human connection. This is strangers helping other strangers in their toughest moment. So thank you. Stay for one second. <laughs> Nancy, you, you can see why announcing her doer award like does a total disservice to the amount of what you're contributing to the world. And I, I think you, you know, all of us are moved by the story you told, by the work you're doing, by the amazing lives you're affecting. And we're just all, I know I am so inspired by what you're building. And we, just, we feel privileged to be a part and help you and help so many people to improve lives. Um, that we're so happy to have you as a part of Twilio.org and to, uh, to do anything we can do to help you to change people's lives. And we are so awed by what you and your amazing team have accomplished today. And we just can't wait to see what's next. Same here. Let's hear it again for Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thanks. Isn't that, that is, is such an amazing story. All right, we wanna talk a little bit more about opportunities to do good in the world. And to do that, I wanna introduce the new executive director of Twilio.org, Aaron Riley. Aaron. Every time I hear Nancy speak, I get choked up. I had to force back the tears because I actually have makeup on today. I am really proud to be up here talking about Twilio.org. We believe that communications unlock hope, freedom, and power. So we work with nonprofits to help them create conversations that change people's lives. And as you just heard from Nancy, Crisis Text Line is using those conversations to give people hope. And that's just one of nearly a thousand nonprofits that we work with in Twilio.org. These are nonprofits that are giving people the power to lift themselves out of poverty or the hope of someone there to help when there is a disaster or freeing someone from sex trafficking. So we are always focused on enabling these nonprofits to advance their missions. And we see opportunities all the time for nonprofits to use technology more to do what they do best. 
And these nonprofits want to use technology, but they don't always have the skills in house or the people in house to be able to do that. And here, we have a room full of people with technical expertise. So today, I want to invite you to use your technical skills to help code a better world. If you are interested in using your skills to help nonprofits on a project by project basis, I'd like you to text do good to the short code Twilio. The number is right behind me. And we're going to build a list. And we will bring you opportunities in the coming year for ways that you can help nonprofits advance their mission with your skills. Or come talk to us today in the Twilio.org booth about how you would like to help. Also, I would like to tell you two other ways everybody here at Signal has helped advance the next generation of developers. Yesterday, during lunch, we all made those cardboard coding kits, and thanks to your effort, we are giving all of the students from grade two to five in McKinley School, right here in San Francisco, their very first taste of coding. Also, because 5% of ticket sales went to scholarships at Hackbright, you all are helping more women learn to code and taking us one step closer to closing that gender gap in technology. <laughs> Thank you. Really, it's it's, I want to thank you all for everything that you have done today and yesterday at Signal, and all that you will continue to do to help code a better world. Thank you so much. Do you want this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon, we're going to meet our last doer, who's actually going to give a talk and perform for us. But before we do that, we want to have a quick discussion. That discussion is about something we've heard about in the news quite a bit that I joked about earlier, bots. And there's a, actually a serious question of whether or not we believe that bots are going to enable us to have great communications or whether or not bots are overhyped and not quite what we think they are. And so to lead a casual discussion that we call bots WTF, Please welcome up Benedict Evans, partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Can you there? Okay. So we've got 15 minutes um, because um, there's so many fantastic other people here that have actually kind of built more stuff than I have. Um, and so Jeff asked us just to come on and actually talk about what we think about bots, um, which uh, seem like they're one of the fundamental kind of new user interface ideas that have blown up this year, despite being kind of 30 years old. Um, and so we had the Facebook event, and we had the Google event, and then we had Microsoft early in the year launching a platform around this, and then obviously we have Mercy from Slack and Chris from Uber, which apparently has some kind of, some kind of user base out there in the world. I, would, I wouldn't know. Um, <laughs> And so I just thought it would be interesting just to start by saying, well, if bot isn't a universal interface, given that we don't have HAL 9000, we don't have general AI, you can't just ask it anything, what do you think it is actually useful for? What are the places where a bot interface really works well? So from my vantage point at Uber, uh, and as in terms of all the things that I've seen out there, um, bots messaging conversation really is about opening up and expanding the number of interfaces that you can interact with computing services. So essentially, previously, we had to be very explicit in our interactions with technology. And through messaging and the rise of the usage of those platforms, I think people are expecting more uh, convenience out of the services that they address. This is forcing, I think, service and technology designers to be more forgiving in the way that they approach technology and to be more ubiquitous across lots of different platforms and contexts. So the opportunity with bots is to really augment those interactions in ways that previously you had to be very explicit. Yeah, I think it's much less obnoxious for a bot to say, let me Google that for you, than for your coworker to do it. And you're like, oh, great, thank you very much. Uh, so I think that you know, bots can buttress customer service. They can help in, uh, in workplace conversations. 
So we have a Slack bot reminder in my uh, growth org channel that I use with my team. And every morning, it prompts us to do a stand up. And there are bots on the Slack platform that also do this. So then we can each do our little bit, which if you're doing it in live space, you would never remember what everyone said that they're working on. But now we have a record, and I can search for it. And if a designer is blocked by an engineer or vice versa, we can then take that into the real world and have a human conversation that isn't just everyone looking at their feet and drinking coffee. Yeah, I think there's, there's kind of an interesting strand, strand here in that you know, kind of the naive thing you can say about bot is, well, that's going to replace every kind of app that I have on my phone. And it clearly doesn't work very well for that. Um, but there are certain use cases where it can work better, like certain kinds of customer service, particularly kind of replacing some kinds of email or replacing some kind of phone call or some kind of, kind of walk across the room and find that guy and ask him something. Um, but there's also a sense of creating some new interaction models and some new use cases and some new ways of solving problems, which is obviously what Slack is doing in the enterprise. Yeah, I mean, it's really early days for all of that stuff. And I think as these use cases develop in the way that people work change, uh, the interface is going to adapt to change that as well. And I mean, AI is not there yet. There's nothing like a human being at the other end of it and getting something into the real world. It's just bots can help you do that more quickly and in a much more courteous way. Yeah, I mean, another way to look at this is like a lot of the technology that we use on, in desktop computing, really, if you go all the way back to like the 60s and like the mother of all demos, um, it came out of like the Cold War and was funded by the Air Force. It was really about information retrieval and making people productive in hierarchical work environments. We now work, live, and play in a variety of contexts where we expect to be able to have access to services wherever we are and whatever we're doing. And so we're forcing technology to actually adapt to us, to lean towards us, as opposed to the way it's been for the last 15 to 20 years, where we've had to lean towards the computers to change the way that we communicate to be able to allow the computer to understand what it is that we're trying to do. And so we're finally getting back to the original vision of computing, which was to augment human intellect and human relationships, which, of course, we've heard a lot about today already. Yeah, I mean, there's a, you know, the, the, if, if bots are the kind of one of the themes of this year, AI is obviously the theme for the next, next 10 years. And I always think like one of my, the bit of my computing experience that hasn't changed in 15 years is copying numbers one at a, a time out of a PDF and putting them into Excel. And, you know, that is AI. That's an AI problem. It's not a HAL 9000 well, problem. Well, it's a really terrible use of human intellect. Yeah, but, yeah. but the point is, you know, I ought to be able to, you know, take, use image. There ought to be a photography story here, an image story there. And, you know, a lot of AI, we tend to think of AI and say, well, that means you'll talk to the computer or that they'll, somehow there'll be something that's kind of Turing, a Turing, passes a Turing test. But actually, it's a lot of it is simply the computer is less dumb. And a conversational UI becomes one of the ways that you can talk to something when it becomes less dumb. It doesn't become the only way of doing it. I mean, on that, on that point, you know, one of the services that I use a lot to do shopping is called Operator. And what I'm able to do, which you can sort of do in Google today, um, is just text an image of the thing that you might want. That kind of conversation sort of goes beyond just typing something out or writing something down to being able to communicate the way that you would communicate with your friends. Like, hey, what do you think about this? Like, you know, should I buy this thing? What do you think about these shoes? Now I can do that with a service that actually can use machine vision and computer learning to actually have an opinion uh, that's informed by a lot of other data points. Yeah, and I think it reduces the cognitive load for the average human being as well. When you're not like, oh, here's this object that I want. Which of these many apps am I going to have to get onto my phone or, God forbid, actually open up your laptop and then load up your mental model of how that app works? You can just say it in the human way that you normally would. Yeah, there's an old computer science saying, almost as old as the mother of all demos, that a computer should never ask a question it should be able to work out the answer to. And I think on the one hand, all of the sensors and connectivity that comes out of the smartphone supply chain, um, which is both directly things like Google Home or Amazon Alexa, but also you know, the Nest thermos thermostat and all kinds of other things, mean the computer can know much more, but it can also now work out much more. It can understand much more. And you know, this is my, you know, my copying stuff out of a PDF. Is, is what the computer should be able to do that. The computer should understand what you mean when you say, when is my next meeting, or what, find me the anomalies in the last 200 purchase orders, or any of those kinds of questions. Um, and so moving that interface from like a kind of a, you know, you have to know which button to press to you can just ask it and it will work out which button you wanted to press is, is part of that, that kind of transition. But to state a maybe unpopular opinion, um, I'm on the older edge of the millennial generation. I know, boo, hiss. Uh, but God forbid I have to use my voice for something other than a conversation with a human being. I hate talking to computers. Uh, I have an Alexa in my home and... You don't use it? Uh, well, I use... I, it turns on my bedroom lights, it can turn on the television, uh, 
but it is actually, it feels like a lot more effort to me to have to tell a robot to do it than to just open up my Sonos app or do something like that. But I'm also from the like, do not call me, please text me generation. So I'm curious to see how that's going to Yeah, work there's out. a great conversation about whether you're allowed to use your Amazon Alexa on Sabbath. <laughs> and then you kind of, you go forward 20 years ago and you change it and it's like, okay, now maybe your Amazon Alexa can be your Shavish Goy. It can be <laughs> the thing that's allowed to turn stuff on for you when you're not allowed right. to. <laughs> Wow. Well, I, you know, part of this, though, is, is also, and I think you, know, you, you talked about this a little bit, but also Jeff talked about it this morning, um, it's the way in which context is able to be sensed on a more personal level. You know, for example, at Uber, we launched an API in January of this year called Trip Experiences, and the idea is essentially that when you're getting into an Uber and you've specified where you're going, that information is hugely valuable. You know, I sort of think about it like GPS++. Like, when I open up Foursquare and I'm in, I'm in my Uber, I don't want to know about things that are like, you know, whizzing by the window. Right. I want to know about recommendations for where I'm going. So the more that we're able to capture that information, make it available to folks like us, like developers, who are building these services that can anticipate and intuit the ways in which these services can actually meet us in the middle as opposed to forcing us to do all that additional context setting, I think those are the companies and the services and brands that are going to do really, really well which, again, builds on Jeff's point. Yeah, and anticipating the need of the user is something that is the pinnacle of customer service. And it's something that you know, bots can help queue up that information for a human being. So you step out of your Uber, and I hand you, you know, a dinner jacket and a glass of champagne, mm -hmm. and you feel like, so yeah. bala. That's right. Yeah. yeah totally, totally. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting kind of spread in here, on the, as I was saying earlier, that on the one hand, a bot is like a completely open-ended interface. You can say anything to it, say far more, far more than you could say in a, in, in a graphical user interface. But on the other hand, because we don't have general AI behind it, there's actually a constrained number of things that you can say. And so there's this sort of interesting question when you then look at something like Google Now, um, that the bot is actually, you don't talk to the bot, the bot talks to you. So the bot only says something when it's got something to say to you. Well, but there's, there's a lot of interesting emerging patterns that, and, and again, we are super early like in this phase of up-leveling kind of like the SMS channel and, though, and that basic uh, modality to be more expressive, as you can see, in like the Telegram platform or the Messenger platform, where you're starting to add little micro-widgets that have some interaction you know, paradigm. And you know, I talked to Connie from Andreessen Horowitz, and she lo was looking at you know, WeChat and the, the ability to sort of invoke a web page. And I think the thing that's really interesting is how we're decomposing all these different services uh, to fit the context and the channel in which they're being delivered. So in other words, Uber doesn't think of itself as being an app company. It thinks of being a service company that happens to have an amazing logistics and technology platform behind it. And so then the question is, how do we deliver our service to as many people as possible in as many places as are convenient? And so it's not so much about the apps per se, it's about actually reaching people through, it could be messaging, it could be desktop, it could be other environments like that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, the, we, we, we have this interesting sort of split between, I mean, thinking back to something you said earlier about, you know, using imaging. Um, I was at a dinner last week and we went around the table saying, what's, your, what's the last bot you used? And I said, Google search, because mm -hmm. um, Google search is a bot, um, giving a product an image and expecting that product to know what that image is or what that means. Well, that's a bot in a sense. Um, there isn't kind of a nice hard line between, well, I have to type something in and press enter, that's a bot, and if it's not, then it isn't. What we're really talking about, I think, is moving away from, well, it's what Google said, you get away from the, the search box and the 10 blue links, and much more into services that have some sense of, well, why am I waiting for that person to tell me what they want? Why am I waiting for them to tell me which of those five buttons I should be tapping on? Why do I have to, why doesn't, you know, since I've, I've had a go at you about this before, like, why doesn't the Uber app or the Lyft app look at my calendar and see where my next meeting is, rather than making me type it in like an animal. Wait you know. for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you know, all, of, all of those kinds of things. And you know, there's this great quote from you know, the, the last, you know, the history of AI, where someone says, as soon as anything starts working, people think it's not magic, it's just computation. Mm -hmm. Like, as soon as any AI technique starts working, people say, well, that's not magic, that's, that's not AI, that's just like, that's just image recognition. That's just location. You know, the fact that Uber or Instagram know where I am, we don't think of that as being AI or even think of that as being a bot. It just disappears into the background. Yes. I was going to actually ask you. Uh, yeah. Good what answer. You, <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what are some, some patterns that you're seeing uh, out, of, out of more successful bots on Slack? Because I think that there's a lot of things that can be done well and a lot of things that can be done terribly well, mm -hmm. Poncho. Um, and so how can you sort of evolve the model um, and sort of take an approach that actually is going to work, uh, like in a context like Slack? 
Yeah, so the work context is interestingly different from a lot of the other contexts, right? So you have to be there and you're sort of like captured in this room, um, either physically or uh, on the internet. And some of the apps that we've seen that have done really well are things that are either retrieving information for you. Obviously, one of our favorite ones that can bring levity to something is like uh, the slash Giphy command. And then there's things like Howdy, which are doing the stand-up type bots. Uh, and these are things that help build the habits for your team that become the cadence and the daily pace. Um, and then there are a lot of uh, other bots that are helping to facilitate um, things like feedback. There's an app called Leo that does that. And these are some of the interesting moments where it's a superhuman conversation and it's a superhuman kind of moment to be giving feedback. But you also need to be reminded to do it. And in order to give really feedback, really good feedback, it needs to be in the moment, it needs to be regular, so that you're giving a good mix of positive and negative feedback. How much personality is coming out of these bots and how useful is, is that? Um, you know, I'm not totally sure. I think you'd have to ask people. Obviously, you know, people come into our app and they uh, start to try to have a conversation with Slackbot, which is really interesting. And I think people really want to communicate and start to talk, but it's going to be, I think, a very exciting next couple of years, both as the platform matures and then as these people who are building businesses on top of Slack are able to get really great information about what is successful for them or not. And I'm really excited to see the different uh, interfaces that emerge from this and then the things that people learn and hopefully share. Yeah, I mean, I think one general principle around this is to really figure out how, how, like, what level of promise can your bot or service make in these conversational contexts. Yeah. For example, if you actually order an Uber within Facebook Messenger and you have any kind of challenge or problem where you want to say hi and like, you know, say something positive, you can do that too. Um, there is actually a human staffing on the other side of that to help you actually resolve your issue as fast as possible. So we have explicitly made the decision not to automate that, that experience or that conversation because we believe that that actually would lead to a worse experience overall. So I think figuring out how to sort of communicate that and message that is really important and providing really good utility um, is one of the pieces that will differentiate, I guess, the services. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's happening is like we don't, we don't have HAL 9000, we don't have general AI, but what we're having are many different techniques and capabilities that let you make the computer less dumb. Yeah. And that's sort of getting to kind of a critical mass or takeoff point where actually that state starts changing a lot of how you might interact with a computer. Yeah. Well, and again, we, we've been trained to know how to use Google and to thrash you know, keyword after keyword. Whereas like, you look at young kids who expect to be able to talk to their TV or touch their TV or talk to any device. And any device that doesn't talk back to them in some conversational way or say, I'm sorry, I can't do that, is broken. So right. in some ways, we're almost like of, a, of an era or a generation where our expectations are too small. And those who actually have expectations that go much you know, bigger and more interesting are Yeah, we're going from the four-year-old who thinks a computer you can't touch is broken to the four-year-old who thinks a computer you can't talk to is broken. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, so it's super exciting, and we're super excited about the future of all this stuff, I think. Fantastic. I think that's, uh, that's it. the end of our whole <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Awesome. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mercy from Slack, Chris from Uber, Ben from Andreessen Horowitz, thank you very much. Um, time to meet our last doer of 2016. And our doer is a Grammy-nominated artist. In fact, he signed his first record contract with Motown Records in 2003. His first record, he sold 180,000 copies of it, and he barely saw any royalties at all. Then his second album came out. And he found that the record label wasn't actually marketing it to all the people who bought the first album. And he asked them why. And the answer was, we don't know who any of those people are. So he went independent, he learned to code, and he built an app so that he could give out his phone number to his fans. And he gives it out at his, at his concerts, in interviews, it's at the top of his Twitter profile. And he's personally replied to over 50,000 fans who have texted him. And now, not only has he used this technology to sell tens of millions of dollars of his music, he's actually raised a million and a half dollars from Ben Horowitz, and he's productizing this technology called Superphone, and he's bringing it to the world so that anybody can text with their fans. And so our last doer of 2016, Grammy-nominated artist, producer, 
coder and entrepreneur, Ryan Leslie. And now I want to invite up Ryan Leslie. Come on up. He's going to tell us a bit more about Superphone, and then he's going to perform for us. What's up, San Francisco? Okay, that's, uh, I guess that's about as much as we're going to get for uh, two hours of sitting here and talking and listening. And, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about Superphone and, and, and uh, how it's actually changed my life. So, like Jeff was saying, I left my record company in 2010. And before I left my record company in 2010, I had already had a little taste of what the world was going to be with the impact of social. So my first project, my first big success story is I put my girl on MySpace. And we had a couple songs on MySpace. And uh, my, my business partner was actually in the room here, Rashid Richmond. He told me, he said, look, Ryan, I want you to go to Google and I want you to search the MySpace keyword. So I searched the MySpace keyword and there was my girl, number two search result, myspace.com slash whatever her name was. We're not together no more. So that's it, that's it. And literally over the course of three months, she went from zero friends on MySpace to 650,000 friends on MySpace. Now, basically that was about 10 years ago. And I watch this kind of phenomenon happen all the time with social media. I don't know if you guys have caught that Chewbacca video, like the girl, I mean, it's a lady in her car and she puts on a Chewbacca mask and she's laughing hysterically and I, I sent it to my girl and she, she took a look at it and was like, man, this is crazy. We should make a Chewbacca mask video and we'll be famous. I said, well, that, that joke is already passed, baby. You know, we, we gotta find something else we could do together. But what is really amazing is that the social platforms of today, they give us the ability to build very, very large audiences. The disconnect, though, is that there isn't really a personal connection to the people who follow me on Instagram. I got 240,000. The people who follow me on Twitter, I got 550,000. The people who like my Facebook page, I got 450,000. The people who subscribe to my YouTube videos, I got over 180,000. But the issue is when I really need them to know about something that's going on, when I really need the people in France to know that I got a concert in two weeks, when I really need the folks in LA to know that I got a concert, when I need the folks around the world who've actually spent more than 500 bucks, when I want to give them the chance to come turn up with me on New Year's Eve, posting widely on a social channel really seems like it's missing the mark. And so that's why I started getting my phone number out. And so initially I, I thought, okay, I can't, I can't use my real cell phone number. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta get a Google Voice number. So I got a Google Voice number and text started coming in. And then, you know, I was excited because like, you know, I, I couldn't respond to the people overseas with Google Voice. So I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell everyone that my Google Voice is connected to WhatsApp. And then people started messaging me on WhatsApp. And then after a while, I had 20,000 conversations I was managing on WhatsApp. And I turned my phone on. And then, you know, 25 minutes later, the battery was dead. So I realized that I needed something a little bit more powerful and actually it's crazy. I was, I was, watching, I was watching a commercial on YouTube uh, and it was Dale Earnhardt Jr. And, and, and basically it was a texting commercial and people say, oh Dale, did you get my text? And I was like, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is giving his number out, man? He stole my idea. <laughs> but what I realized is that when people texted Dale, the number would actually send them back a download link for a Sprint Drive Safe application, which would help you to focus on driving. So when people texted while the vehicle was in motion, right, it would, uh, it would actually say, hey, I'm driving right now, I'll hit you later, right? And I said, wow, if, if that's possible, is, is this possible globally, right? And someone reached out to me and said, yo, Ryan, you know, that, that's, not, that's not actually AT&T, it's actually Twilio. I said, okay, awesome, I'm getting me a Twilio account. And uh, I didn't realize that you, like, have to know how to code if you get a Twilio account, right? <laughs> and so uh, 
I discovered Twilio. I realized that it has a cool API and it could actually, you know, it could do the things I wanted to do. And what I really wanted to do was three things. For anyone that texted me, I wanted to know three things. Number one, and my, you could try it, right? If you send me a text, my phone is automatically, this is very, very simple. It's not even bot level. It's like simple stuff, right? Number one, who are you? I don't recognize this number. Give me your first name, last name, email, zip code, so I can, you know, know where you are, right? Who are you? Number two, I realize I can get even more sophisticated. So I have a Shopify store, and I can check when someone adds their email to my phone, I can check on my Shopify store, and I can check and see if they've ever bought my album. And if they haven't, I can recommend it <laughs> gently. So if Rashid sent me a text right now, it would first hit him back and say, hey, I don't recognize this number, I need your info. And I'll send him to a form, he can fill out the info, and now he's in my phone. The same as if I actually took up my phone, handed it to him, and said, fill it in, right? Virtually. Number two, once I have him in my actual database, I can cross-check my Shopify store and see if that email's ever made a purchase. If it hasn't, it can say, hey, Rashid, I noticed maybe you didn't hear about my new album. Here's a link to it if you want to check it out. The third thing that I wanted to do, and most importantly, is I wanted to give acknowledgement and appreciation to the people who were still supporting me, even though I wasn't on a big label anymore. I wanted to acknowledge and appreciate those people. So there it was. I could actually trigger a thank you text. Just say thank you. You know, I saw you just got my album five minutes ago, man. I just want to thank you. And you know what? I see you live in, uh, in LA, so I'll text you next time I'm performing. Literally, my entire life started to change. Not just because I had a 50% conversion rate on sales, right? Because when you think about it, like, uh, you know, if, if I was to ask Rashid straight up, say, hey, man, can I borrow $10? It's 50-50, you know? Either, either I'm selling him a reason to give me $10 or he's selling me a reason why he shouldn't, right? So that's the beauty of sort of one-to-one -one communication. And it's also, it, it's text, it's, it's text. It's, it's, and also, I'm really excited about like notify. So, so now I can actually, if Rashid doesn't want to be texted, if he prefers Facebook Messenger, I can hit him on Facebook Messenger or WeChat. But the beauty of this is that it started to give real depth to the people that supported me. I can now just look at my phone and if I'm running late for a Delta Red Eye flight, I can check and see if I have any fans in my phone book who work for Delta. <laughs> if I'm doing a late night studio session and, you know, uh, you know I, I forgot my credit card or whatever, I can see if uh, any of my fans work for Domino's Pizza and want to send me a pizza to the studio. <laughs> And, you know, people, you know, when I talk about this, a lot of people say, well, Ryan, you know, aren't, aren't you just, isn't that just like super duper fan exploitation, man? Like, is it enough that you have enough uh, information on them that, you know, you can actually sell out concerts, you're selling records direct? And what I realize is that people actually, when they have a personal connection, they want to support you more than just a $10 album sale. They want to support you more than just a $1 single. And so, I think what really started to happen for me is, uh, is I just realized that um, the people who support me are actually real people. <laughs> They're not just social media profiles. They're not just a mass of followers. It's not just a number of, uh, uh, of engagements or a percentage of, uh, of conversion. They're actually real people. And they want to support you, like I said, or for me, they wanted to support me beyond just an album purchase. So being here in San Francisco, being in Silicon Valley, right, which I never really, uh, I mean, I, I went to Harvard from uh, a small city called Stockton, California, Bear Creek High School, and I went to Harvard out of my junior year. Oh, Stockton in the building. <laughs> so I went to Harvard out of my junior year from Stockton, Bear Creek High School, and I didn't know anything about the Valley. And in 2013, when I started doing this, I put my cell phone number on Twitter and actually reached out to somebody with a cold tweet. I'm now an investor in his latest round. He runs a company called Walker & Company. His name is Tristan Walker. And I said, oh, somebody knows Tristan? Tristan fan in the building. One of them. Got you. I see you, man. 
So he went through the process, and he said, you know what? Uh, after he got the thank you for getting my record, he said, yo, Ryan, is this, is this really you? Is this real? I said, yeah, man, it's really me. This is my number. He said, well, you need to meet Ben Horowitz. I said, okay, who's that? <laughs> he said, yo, man, look him up. He's, he's pretty cool. He's awesome. Right? So, so I looked him up. It took me a couple of months to actually finally get the meeting. And I went in and I told him my story. And I told him that uh, I went to Code Academy to basically learn the basics of how to get Twilio to do what I needed it to do. Because really, it's just, I couldn't sign up for a Twilio account like a Google Voice account, right? And uh, he said, yo, Ryan, this is pretty awesome. It's, it's really amazing when founders solve their own problems. I said, well, what do you mean, founders? I mean, this is my super phone. <laughs> and he said, he said, no, Ryan, this is a problem that every modern person, really, that is building relationships on social, this is a problem that they have, right? And you're solving it. So I'm in. I said, okay, what does that mean? I said, what's that? What's that? <laughs> and so he actually anchored a seed round. We just closed a million and a half dollar seed round so that we could actually give this kind of messaging, this kind of relationship management, this kind of personal relationship management at scale to small businesses, Shopify store owners, networkers, founders. We've even got investment companies that accept pitches via text because they can send them to the form and actually look at the end of the day and see how many founders actually pitch them. So I'm really just inspired to be here. I never thought that me looking for a way to actually say thank you to my fans would ever land me on a stage early in the morning <laughs> in front of thousands of developers and founders and really, really super smart people. Uh, but if you'd like to connect with me personally, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you send me a text and you actually do enter your info on my phone and there is something that we really can do together, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised. I have lots of investors, I have lots of athletes, I have lots of artists, and I hope that today, based on the power of personal communication, I can count many of you as friends. And before I get out of here, I want to give you an example. I was uh, trying to figure out how messaging or how activating and galvanizing and energizing supporters could actually help me not necessarily to make more money, but reduce the cost of me expressing myself on the level I wanted to express myself. Now, you have to forgive me because I have done work with Kanye, Jay, etc., and those guys like to live really big really big. So I said, yo, I'm independent, man, and uh, I want to do this video, but I want it to be big. I want the idea to be big. It doesn't have to be like super heavily produced, but the concept is really simple. I want 30 Lamborghinis. <laughs> and so we decided we we're going to price this out, right? We wanted to price this out. I talked to a producer and she said, okay, well, what kind of Lamborghinis you want? I said, well, you know, the kind that drive really fast and like, you know, but I wanted 80s and 90s Diablos and Countaches, right? Okay, we got some car buffs in the building, right? And so uh, she said, okay, Ryan, well, uh, listen, um, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best for you, but I'm going to tell you straight out of the gate, the ballpark price for something like this is probably, be, probably about $3,000 a car. You want 30 of them just to get the cars reserved is going to be 90,000. That didn't include the shooters, the camera, the production equipment, anything like that. So uh, I, I, I went through my uh, phone, not necessarily to look for Lamborghini owners, but someone actually sent me a text and uh, he said, yo, Ryan, man, you know, I, I like this song that you have. It's called Swiss Franks. And, um, you know, uh, I wanted to send you a YouTube video of my birthday celebration. So I, I clicked on the YouTube video and I saw that he just had all these Lamborghinis pulling up to his birthday celebration. <laughs> and I said, yo, man, um, wow, that's cool. You made a video. You made the video I want to make. <laughs> and he said, yo, Ryan, um, if you put me because I'm a big fan of yours. If you give me a cameo in your video, I will make sure that I get 30 
80s and 90s, Diablos and Countaches to show up on set for your video free of charge. And I said, wow, that is cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so before I get out of here, I'm going to give you a, his name is T-Ball Vinrini. And, uh, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm going to perform the song. I'm going to let you guys see the video. Like I said, it's, it's a very, very simple video. I'm just in a garage surrounded by 30 Lamborghinis. And I was really, <laughs> But in any case, T-Ball Van Rini, right? And what was so beautiful about this, I want you guys, as I'm performing, I want you to check the third verse, okay? Because I give him a cameo, I, I give him a shout out in the third verse. And he says, yo, Ryan, you know, it's my first time in a music video, man. So, you know, I want to do this cool thing for the cameo. And I said, all right, cool. I'm going to give you one shot. And if you get it wrong, then you're just going to sit in the video like this with shades on. <laughs> and so... We, we, we did the take because we, we shot the whole video in one day. We got a lot of Lamborghinis there. We got to shoot it all in one day. We don't want two days of, you know, Lamborghinis there, right? So he says, yo, Ryan, here's what I want to do for my cameo. I want the camera to pan up, and then I want you to walk up to me in a Lamborghini, and I want you to give me a, you know, give me some dap, and then that's my cameo. And so I want you to look for the cameo, right, to see if he got this right. But basically what happened is the shot happened. I went up. Gave us some dap, and then he just wouldn't let go. <laughs> and so if you look in the third verse, you'll see that T-Ball Van Rini, my homie, who provided 30 Lamborghinis for this shoot, is sitting there with the shades on, just like this. But without further ado, <laughs> I'd like to give you a preview. Yeah. Supermodel said I'm handsome Dad fell in love with her He just won a grandson I was in the studio I was skipping classes Fifteen braces plus coke bottle glasses Living in the future now Being broke is past this Cash game stupid boy I ain't with the plastic People ask me how I'm living I say very great I switched my level from a feather to a heavyweight You see I laid the blueprints So y'all can replicate Ask me how I rose above I learned to levitate Made some money put my mom in that Mercedes ride yep. Felt so good to see the pride in my old lady's eyes I, love her. I pray for her success and her continued health I love her. Spend it on her for I spend this money on myself Yeah uh. Come sit at my round table, I got all the answers yeah. Teach you how to hustle, put you in the trenches You should know that money from these labels too expensive They take your money, then they put you on the fucking shelf You be better off to do that shit your fucking self One to one, homie, move that music hand to hand 18 months, I was looking at 500 grand Future looking brighter through my new gazelles 40,000 strong, you should see my ticket sales Girls screaming, we do them real sets We burn states, girls screaming We writing rules, man, we turn pages Yeah. Vision taking pictures from my history book The legends, fuck with me, I'ma show you how this history look real good. Everything I recorded is till the end of time. time They gon' have to take it from me, I'm defending mine The champ, the champ I don't ever give up, yeah. I don't ever give up uh. Yeah. Grab myself a hundred with 
horses, that mean I'm a genie 580 horses in my Lamborghini When I pull them beauties out, that mean I'm with Van Rini I'm disguising 30 cars, that mean you never see me I'm good to my women, sleep as much as I can Quit my sins are forgiven, put my trust in his hands We gon' take it to the pinnacle, the highest heights Before I leave this mortal earth, they gon' say Ryan nice a legend, I don't never give up, I don't never give up, I don't never break down, never gonna break down, never see me giving in, no, I don't never give up, I don't never give up, I don't never break down, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, my name is Ryan Leslie, it's been a pleasure rocking with y'all today, Jeff, thanks for giving me this platform, man, let's hear for Ryan! Awesome story. That's amazing. Thank you. Awesome story. What a great way to close out Signal. If you had fun at Signal, you know, we're trying to do something with Signal, a conference like no other. If you had fun here, first of all, we're going to London in September. So you can come to Signal in London in September. And... We will be right back here at Pier 27 one year from now, May 2017. And you can buy your tickets today for only 250 bucks inside. You get a special deal if you buy it today for all of you as a thank you for being here. This has been awesome. We've had some amazing speakers. Have fun today. We'll see you tonight at Bath. Thank you.